So next up, we have Dr. Marianthi Kimojogli. I apologize again. Um, presently, Dr. K is Assistant Professor of Environmental Health Sciences at Columbia University, the Mailman School of Public Health. Dr. K's research focuses on applied statistical issues related to environmental epidemiology. Her studies primarily focus on air pollution exposure and on identifying vulnerable subpopulations and characteristics of how, how, how characteristics how risks may vary across neighborhood level and other urban characteristics, as well as a changing climate. Dr. K recently published a study on DES grandchildren based on the Nurses Study 2 that was partially funded by the Escher Foundation, uh, who's a, a, a sponsor of the conference. And I'd like to personally thank Jill for all the support that her foundation and she has given to this research area. So Dr. K, up to you. <laughs> Sorry, while I'm uh, sharing my screen, it's hard to find sometimes the unmute button. Uh, thank you very much, both for the invitation to present our results and for organizing and holding this session and this conference. Uh, my last name is Kimur Zoglu, but I know it's no one should ever have to say that. I think you did an excellent job, though, and Dr. K or just Marianti is also perfectly fine. Um, so thank you. You um, already uh, a lot of the information that is on this uh, uh, slide has been uh, covered in this uh, session. Just very briefly, DES was prescribed to pregnant women between 38 and 71. Although the exact number of women is not known who use DS during pregnancy, it's estimated that approximately five to 10 million women in the US use DS, uh, but also it wasn't only in the US. The first study uh, that showed no actual treatment value came out in 1953. This is when um, DS started to phase out, uh, but not completely and very slowly until 1971 where and, and the next study came out linking DES to rare vaginal and adenocarcinomas in DES uh, daughters. And that's when DES was banned. Um, since then, uh, DES has been linked to multiple reproductive outcomes in DES water, uh, daughters. And we also start seeing multi-generational DES impacts, such as hypospadias, delayed menstrual regularization, birth defects, and others, as we just heard. And uh, just linking back this session to the previous session on, on EDCs, endocrine disrupting chemicals, DES is a very potent EDC. Uh, what uh, these EDCs are, basically they are any exogenous outside our body agents that mess up with how hormones uh, are synthesized and behave in our bodies. We care about EDCs because several high production volume chemicals uh, ubiquitously present in commercial products are known or suspected EDCs. And because of this very widespread use in those consumer products, the exposure of uh, two EDCs is very highly prevalent, population-wide exposures. And DES um, if, uh, is very structurally and functionally similar to bisphenol A, a known um, EDC. Um, but it's much, much more potent than uh, bisphenol A. This is just an example of some of the products that contain EDCs that we all uh, use in our everyday lives. EDCs have been linked to numerous health outcomes, including but not limited to uh, disruptions to male and female reproductive systems, development of cancer, obesity, and neurodevelopmental disorders, including um, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, ADHD, which is the focus of what I will be talking today. And these are especially following in utero exposures. Now, why are we interested in multi-generational effects of DES? Um, it is very important to continue studying those for two main reasons, there are more, but two main reason is one, to continue to understand the devastating effects of DES use during pregnancy. Um, and second is to understand the potential impact of current exposure to EDCs in the population. And even though these are not as potent as DES, we are ubiquitously exposed. So we don't know the potential cumulated effects of exposure to less potent uh, EDCs during pregnancy, multi-generationally. So just, just sorry, as I just said, there is an increasing interest in the potential multi and transgenerational effects of EDC's EDC exposure. And the hypothesized biological mechanism is that of a genetic uh, transgenerational inheritance, 
basically it's assumed that EDCs um, lead to molecular alterations to the germline mediated through epigenetic mechanisms to promote outcomes to subsequent generations. As an example of uh, two toxicological studies here, uh, this um, phthalate uh, was found to alter the third generation behavior and stress responses and observed uh, corticosterone levels and pituitary gene expression in behavior in mice. And BPA has also, bisphenol A, uh, found to lead to changes in third to fifth generation social interactions in mice. Um, as you see, uh, these are both toxicological evidence of uh, multi intragenerational effects of EDCs on neurodevelopmental um, outcomes. However, epidemiological evidence on multi-generational EDC and neurodevelopment in humans is lacking, as Dr. Titus described um, in, in the presentation above. It's very hard to find um, data in cohorts that have been following people across generations. So we have been able, with the scientific community, to look into some outcomes um, before our study, uh, no one had looked at neurodevelopment before. So for this, we uh, conducted this study to uh, quantify the effects of DES use uh, during pregnancy on third generation ADHD. We used for this study the Nurses Health Study uh, 2. Uh, this is a cohort enrollment started in 1989. Approximately 120,000 registered nurses enrolled. The way the cohort works is that every two years, the nurses receive mailed questionnaires and they uh, fill in and respond back. These questionnaires include information on lifestyle, risk factors, medication use, major illness occurrence, basically anything we can imagine. Uh, and it has a very high retention rate, above 90%. So our study participants are, in this case, the F1 generation. And um, these are the nurses. And they were all born between 1946 and 1964, which is exactly when DES was uh, most heavily prescribed. We um, just <laughs> a representation of what F0, F1, and F2 is, uh, and specifically in this study, our study participants are F1. These are the nurses, uh, they are enrolled participants. We have information of the F0 generation. These are the mothers of the nurses who used DES, some of them used DES, while pregnant with the nurse, as well as information on, on the F2 generation. These are the children of the nurse. So in this case, because our main uh, participant is F1, we have F0, F1 pairs. Um, and because also F1 is female in this case, all three generations in our case were exposed to DES in utero. So this is a multi-generational study, not a transgenerational study because we don't have uh, effects in a, in a generation that was not directly exposed to DES in this case. Um, more detail on our study population. Again, enrollment started in uh, 89. The DES question uh, was asked in 93. And uh, two questions about our outcome were asked in the 2005 and 2013 questionnaires. We excluded nurses who did not return the 93, 2005, or 2013 questionnaires that did not report any live-born children. Uh, and unfortunately, we also had to exclude women who had multiple pregnancies, uh, such as twins, triplets, et cetera, or same-year births, even if from different birth uh, pregnancies, just because the way the question was asked in the questionnaire, the way to identify ADHD children was only through their birth year. So the question was, um, do you have any of your children been diagnosed with ADHD? If yes, what year were they born? So if there were multiple births in that year, we don't know if that would, uh, if the yes would uh, refer to some or all of the children born in that year. So in the end, we ended up with um, a little bit more than 47,000 F0, F1 pairs and a bit more than 106,000 F2 children. For DES assessment, this was F1 self-reported. So F1 reported if her mother used DES during the pregnancy with her in the 93 questionnaire. I should say that uh, that was a yes, no question. To those women who answered yes, uh, we mailed a subsequent supplementary questionnaire 
um, to ask uh, how certain they were. And 88% um, uh, of the 85% who responded to that questionnaire were certain or someone certain of F0 use. So we used this um, number as the uh, exposed um, population. Uh, this questionnaire, the supplemental questionnaire, also included information on the trimester that DES was used. So we're also able to look at whether this made a difference in, in um, ADHD. For the ADHD assessment, as I said, the question, there was a first question, the 2005 questionnaire, has any of your children received the doctor's diagnosis? Yes, no, but no further question here about how many or which children. This was corrected in the 2013 questionnaire, uh, where we repeated the question, further requesting information on the birth year or years, if more than one children, of the F2 generation with an ADHD diagnosis. Um, we included uh, the information only when 2005 and 2013, uh, where the responses were concordant, uh, which was for the great majority of the cases anyway. And um, we used the 2013 response to identify the number of F2 children per F1 um, with ADHD. Now, uh, the variables we had to adjust for in um, the statistical model, this is a bit trickier to think now that we have three generations uh, and we need to make sure that we take um, into account potential variables that could induce a statistical association um, but just because of some correlation. So uh, we were very careful to try and think what these variables would be. Um, so we included uh, smoking. Uh, we uh, F1 were asked if their mother smoked during pregnancy. So we included F0 smoking pregnancy. We also uh, included socioeconomic factors at the time of the F1 birth. Uh, so basically what they ended up including was uh, race and ethnicity, year of birth, just because both DS use and ADHD diagnosis have strong time trends and we needed to control for that. F0 smoking during pregnancy, if F0 uh, owned uh, their home uh, during, um, at the time of F1's birth, and also um, both the F0 and the F1's father education and occupation. For statistical analysis, we use cluster-weighted um, generalized estimated equations with a logit link to account for multiple F2 within F0, F1. Um, that also took care of the informative clustering that we had. Uh, we adjusted, as I said, for potential confounders. Uh, we also assessed effect modification by F2 sex. So in the previous presentation, the uh, effect estimates uh, in some cases varied for sons or daughters. In this case, we did not detect uh, statistically significant effect modification, so I will not be showing you these results, uh, but we did test for it. These are some uh, descriptive statistic, uh, statistics in our population. As I said, uh, we had about uh, 47,000 pairs of F0, F1, and more than 100,000 uh, children. Um, the prevalence of DES use in this population was 1.8%. We had eight, um, 861 F0 used DS during their pregnancy with uh, the nurses. Uh, the majority of um, the F0 um, were educated with at least a high school um, diploma or um, some college. Um, about a quarter smoked during uh, pregnancy, and this was a predominantly uh, white population. For the children, uh, all children were born between 78 and 88. Um, 1983 was the median year. So this is an older um, generation, I would say now for children. This, um, so the prevalence of ADHD in this uh, population was 5.3, but because they were born uh, much earlier, this is actually lower than ADHD, the ADHD prevalence we observed now in children um, uh, of seven years old, for example. And these are our main results. So if you um, look just at the top part of this table, this is our main uh, results, uh, the adjusted odds ratio 
for uh, use of DS during pregnancy and third generation ADHD. Um, and we observed that on average, children uh, who were exposed, uh, I guess, in utero third generation, uh, whose grandmothers used DES when they were pregnant, had 36% higher odds of uh, developing ADHD. And this was statistically, pretty statistically uh, significant. And then we were also able to look at the trimester that DES was used. And we saw that um, if DES was used during the first trimester, uh, the odds of ADHD was 63% higher than if no DES was used. And um, the effect estimates for the second and third trimester, uh, as well as for um, those who did not know what trimester were all not statistically significant. So, we observe strong harmful effect estimates of DES use on third generation ADHD. Now I realize, I thought these were strong, but after some estimates we saw in the previous um, presentation, uh, this may not seem as, as strong, um, but our results were very robust to sensitivity analysis. I'm not showing you here. I, 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 I'm happy to discuss this further, but they were really very robust to any sensitivity analysis we ran. Um, as we discussed, one potential biological mechanism is that of epigenetic transgenerational inheritance. However, it's not the only potential mechanism. So for example, if DES leads to F1 ADHD, and unfortunately we did not have information about F1 ADHD, so we're not able to check this, uh, studies have shown that, the, that there is a possibility of assortative uh, mating. So if F1 ADHD um, then has a child with someone else also with ADHD, then that could be another mechanism through which the third generation could have ADHD, but it would still go back to DES, even if though it's not through, uh, may not be through epigenetic transgenerational inheritance. We saw the DES use um, during the first trimester seemed to be particularly harmful. Um, the use during second and third trimester were uh, weaker and not significant, but we uh, these uh, estimates did have uh, were attenuated and had uh, wider CIs, and this could be because we had much smaller numbers of women uh, uh, who used DS in the second and third trimester. So only uh, 32, th th excuse me, 33 and 27 compared to 82 who used DS in the first uh, trimester. So our results, uh, however, could suggest uh, that uh, the first trimester is a critical window of vulnerability to DS exposure and potentially to EDC exposure. Early gestation is especially sensitive to maternal influences resulting in embryonic and germ cell reprogramming. And during this period, a wave of genome demethylation followed by de novo uh, remethylation occurs together with the establishment of imprints and germination of sex. So, there is biological plausibility for why I uh, use uh, during first trimester could be critical, but I don't think our analysis um, can definitively answer that because of the small numbers uh, of, of women using DES in the second and third trimester. So in conclusion, our findings have important implications for exposures to other environmental endocrine distractors, um, so including ubiquitous chemicals such as bisphenol A, phthalates, et cetera, during pregnancy and third generation adverse health effects. So with that, I would like to thank uh, my collaborators, Mark, Brent, Alberto, and Eilish, who uh, really participated in this work, but also Glenn and Sebastian, who did not uh, participate in the work that I showed you. But when we are now thinking of epidemiologic studies in a multi-generational settings, that there are many uh, methodological, new methodological challenges there. So Glenn and Sebastian, um, and together uh, with the team, but they are leading um, novel uh, methods development to allow us, to give us the tool to robustly analyze these multi-generational associations. And of course, uh, our funding, and, and as you said, uh, the ESSER uh, Fund uh, for Autism also partially funded uh, this study. And with that, thank you very much. And I'll take uh, questions. Great. Thank you, Mariantha. Um, 
I don't see any questions, but, but I actually have, a, I think, an easy question. Um, the nurses study two, the DES exposure came from the, from F1, from the DES daughters. So it was, it record, was it checked by record? Do they have that or is this based on recollection? Yes. So they, the, based on recollection. So the 93 questionnaire was based on recollection and then was followed up to confirm. Uh, I will also say though, that there was a separate study that was mailed directly to F0 uh, mm -hmm. for questions. Uh, that was a smaller subset. And um, they asked in that subset whether they used DES. So we also, the validation that, the, in that subset, we validated that indeed uh, what F1 had said was in agreement with what F0 said. And one of the sensitivity analyses that we ran was in the subset for which we have we had f0 direct information and our results were the same so uh, that that we don't there's obviously some bias in that but we don't think it was uh greatly influential okay and, and actually a quick question that was asked by somebody uh, yesterday to me um do you have um and this might be a question for everyone but do we have a, a date um, for when DS grandchildren started and end? Is there, you know, like, we know when utero exposure was 1938 to 1971, do we have any feel for the age of grandchildren? I mean, obviously it could be a huge age. Yes. Exactly, so, so that's a, a, an excellent point. In, in our data, and I can only talk about our data, the daughters F1 were born, um, between 46 and 64, so right in between um, 38 and 71. And the F2 children were born between uh, 78 and 88. So I'm guessing it could go um, earlier in the 70s and later in the 80s as well, but that would be the main um, um, area to, to uh, yes, to look at. Thank you, great, thank you very much. Absolutely. Um, keep an eye out, if you would, in the Q&A for any questions to answer directly. And, and there will be time again to, I believe, oh. ask questions afterwards. Yes. Sorry, this is just a comment uh, that I think it was just exactly for, for your question. Someone just said that uh, she's a granddaughter born in 1947. 1947? So uh, no, 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 74. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's my English not <laughs> behaving. I'm very sorry, 74. Thank you. Thank you, participant. <laughs> okay.